Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to this, the eighth meeting of the Justice Committee in 2015. Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and electronic devices which interfere with broadcasting, even if they're put at silent. No apologies have been received. I move on to item one in the agenda. It's our main item of business, second evidence session on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill. We'll hear from two panels of witnesses. And I welcome our first panel of witnesses, Dr. Marie O'Neill, Senior Lecturer, Dundee Business School, Law Division, University of Aberdeen, and Dr. Paul Rigby, Lecturer, Social Work, University of Stirling. And can I, I invite immediately questions from members, please? Are you awake? Yes, Gil Patterson, Elaine. Good morning. Uh, I know that one or two people that have came before us are concerned about the definition. I've been looking through written evidence, and we have evidence from the Edinburgh Bar Association, the Fis uh, Faculty of Advocates, the Crown Office uh, Fiscal Service, and they take a different view on that. Maybe for clarity and to put in the record, I'll read out a couple of their uh, keynote uh, 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 indicators. Um, the uh, Edinburgh Bar Association say, uh, that they welcome the principle and introduction of a single offence to be known as the offence of human, human trafficking. We note that the offence is drawn sufficiently broadly to criminalise those whose roles may be ancillary to some extent, i.e. the facilitators, but whose participation is not, nonetheless an essential element in the process of trafficking of human beings. I, I wouldn't take too long, but I think it's worth, uh, worth, worth me bringing it to, to your attention. Um, from the Faculty of Advocates, they simply say, we welcome the principle, the introduction of single offence in the interest of clarity. And finally, and it's another short statement, um, and this one comes from the, the, uh, the Crown Office and Fiscal Service. I, they say support, they support the move to consolidate the existing law in order to provide a single human trafficking offence and a single offence of ex exploitation, both of which will assist prosecutors in the preparation and presentation of evidence. So the people that, that are in the kind of area uh, of prosecution seem to be supporting this. And if, if you read through it, it it's, quite, it's quite substantial. So I wonder... Um, with that type of evidence that we're presented with, if, if you could give us your views on it to give, give us some information that might assist us in, in, in the long run. And can I say to, to the witnesses that uh, the mic <coughs> come on when I call, you don't need to press a button, and if you just indicate if you want to come in, so which person, which one wants to come in first, please? Dr O'Neill. If I may, um, thank you. Um, I come to this as an EU lawyer rather than a Scots criminal lawyer, so there, there may be some discrepancies in my approach. But uh, yes, I, I do welcome the, the draft of the bill and um, the single definition of human trafficking. It was pretty complex in previous legislation. It's also very interesting you put it together with uh, the slavery, forced labour um, definitions. Uh, like some of the submissions, I would have... Um, some concerns about the word travel because human tra while, while the directive is focusing on transnational crime, uh, human trafficking can happen within a jurisdiction and possibly could happen uh, to take an extreme case from one street to the next. So um, I would have some concerns about the word travel. I think also in the definition, comparing it with the provisions in the EU directive, um, the Scottish, the current draft doesn't appear to make reference to uh, begging or forced begging, which was an issue down in London. There's been a big uh, cross-border policing operation on that, uh, Operation Gulf. Um, the reference to exploitation of criminal activities, illegal adoption or forced marriage, which I know is covered by Scottish law, but perhaps could be referred to in, in this particular legislation. And, um, yep, that would be my points on the definition. Comment. Thank yeah, you. I mean, I, I, occasionally, um, I've questioned the word travel as an issue within in trafficking. Um, trafficking isn't just about travel, it's recruitment, harbouring, receipts, etc. So I think the focus on travel does take away the focus from some of the other acts that are involved in the issue. I'm particularly concerned that it doesn't really give much prominence to the issue of children and that the, the means isn't really necessary for an offence of trafficking against children. 
So as long as we have the act and the purpose, which is the recruitment for the purposes of exploitation, that would be trafficking for, uh, against children. And I don't think that's reflected enough in the bill in terms of, of looking at the specifics of children in that case. But otherwise, I, I would agree with, with Marie in terms of the issues that she's raised. Can I just uh, say, do you, do you think we require something other than just person? Do we need a separate section with reference to children with a definition of a child? I, I, if, if I may, I would also have some views on the position of children. Uh, when comparing it with the um, draft <coughs> directive, I am aware that there are provisions in, in Scottish legislation dealing with children. However, the, the directive does require um, distinct provisions in its implementation legislation uh, to deal with children, which I think may be a problem. Also, the, the directive is very clear on defining children as anybody under the age of 18, and the presumption in, in, in a lack of certainty is that the individual is under the age of 18 until that is proven, and I think it would be helpful if that was in the directive expressly, even though I've no doubt it's intended um, that that is the case uh, by the Scottish Parliament. Um, there are also requirements in the directive for support and, and assistance um, for children. Um, again, it would be helpful if that was in the implementing provisions. The, the Scottish Bill does provide for support and assistance for adult victims, and presumably um, you intend on relying on the Vulnerable Witnesses Scotland Act 2014. However, an express reference to that would also be useful. Um, there, there are also provisions in the directive about uh, access to legal guardians um, <coughs> and um, the need, presumably, which would be automatic in Scotland, the need for special investigation and criminal procedures in the case of a child. But I think some of your... Um, submitters have raised concerns about children who are under the age of 18 but perhaps age of 16 and 17 and I think that sh issue would need to be expressly addressed for the avoidance of doubt. Thank you. Yes? Uh, yes, I, I would echo most of those points. It's, um, I think there needs to be something about the definition of the age of a child and, and most crucially the presumption of that age where there's any doubt in terms of support and provision. I understand that there's also been um, recognition that existing legislation in Scotland under the child protection system or children's healing system is, is sufficient. I think the evidence over the few years that we've been looking at this would suggest that that always isn't the case and some of the young people, especially the 16 and 17 year olds, are falling through the gap in terms of provision under the um, Children's Scotland Act and perhaps under the, 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 the newer Children's Hearing Act in terms of access to children's hearing. So I think there needs to be something that's specifically about the age of a child and that presumption that the age is, that the person is a child until it's proven otherwise. Gil? Um, I still am not entirely sure on my first question in regards to the single definition, uh, you know, the principle of a single offence which I think means that it catches everything. That's my interpretation. So that every eventuality, uh, a prosecution can take place. Uh, so I, I'm not quite sure in, in your answers uh, how you feel about that. You've kind of moved on to other aspects of it, which I definitely have a question with regards to children. Uh, and, and maybe I'll pose that at the moment and give you, uh, you can answer the two questions. Uh, I had the experience, uh, we adopted a child from uh, abroad and the self-support group that we had, uh, many children came from different circumstances and some people are convinced that the child, uh, because of the circumstances where the child in the home country was maybe abandoned, had no clue about the age, but an age was given and people are convinced that the child was not that age. So that if you define a child uh, not knowing the age, would they perhaps, would, would they in some way be left out this legis legislation? Because as I understand it, as I understand it, many of the children, uh, you can't tell what age they are. So if you were a uh, plain devil's advocate, if you left it in the way of describing it as youth, as what the intention is, is it not maybe a broader uh, way to capture uh, and, uh, and assist rather than if you define an age under 18 uh, then you would need to, in law I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not a lawyer 
I'm not sure if you would need to actually prove that the child was that actual I age. Think, I think given the previous evidence, we, but I think you were also perhaps saying this, that there might be a presumption on a reasonable, some kind of reasonableness test, a presumption that the person is 18 or under, given that we know there are many, as you've just narrated, many countries where there may not be documentation. Somebody might not even know uh, the age of a child anecdotally or anything. So I think you, I think Dr. O'Neill, you addressed that, did you not? We need something in a test. The, the EU legislation has made a specific policy decision to assume that an individual is under the age of 18 in the absence of evidence to the contrary. And I think the requirement is to protect all children equally even if they're 16 or 17, which I think, in this legislation, even though there would be different ages for different purposes in other parts of society for this legislation, people are still very vulnerable at the ages of 16 and 17. Yeah, sorry. Yes, sorry. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the presumption that a person is under 18 is sufficient in terms of um, the EU directive, if we have that presumption. The reality in practice of assessing that age is extremely complex. At the moment, it generally rests with social workers working to the guidance that was published, um, I think it was two or three years ago. So that the complexities of identifying the age of a young person is, is immense and that there's no scientific test that can do that. But at the moment, I think the presumption that somebody is under 18 until proven otherwise, which at the moment is through an age assessment, is, is the one that we, that we should work with. I'd just, I'd just like to pick up on the, the issue of a single definition. That, that's extremely welcome as, as a way forward. Uh, in my experience, a single definition will never address or capture the full complexities of all the different behaviours that we've identified over the years that may constitute trafficking. So there has to be some flexibility within that so actually naming types of exploitation is useful but we always identify other types of exploitation in in, in practice and it's really difficult to to to, to stick with a, a set definition that can't be changeable as we learn more about trafficking and what's been which what's been happening and one one of the issues that we we probably do need to focus on for, for adults and children is the definition of what is exploitation as opposed to the to the acts in, and the, the um, United Nations, a, a briefing paper around the abuse of position of vulnerability is quite useful in that, in terms of, of looking at um, what exploitation is without actually naming the exploitation. Um, so that leaves it a bit more wide open for looking at different types of exploitation. So that's, that's a quite, that would be a useful starting point in terms of looking at offences and exploitation or actions and exploitation. But you can be exploited without being trafficked. Absolutely, yeah. that's the problem, yeah. yeah. Gil? Yeah, well, uh, similar thoughts to myself. I, I always worry about when you define everything and you miss something out, so that means you're excluding something. So if you, if you leave, if you leave uh, a, a broad definition that captures all, and I think that's what the intention is here, so that nothing escapes through the net, that's more a comment than, than, than uh, asking a question. So I'm, I'm grateful for, for, for that uh, point that you've raised. Are you suggesting a catch-all sub-clause sub somewhere here, you know, something or, or such other activities as could be deemed to reasonably something or other trafficking so that you've got that sort of flexibility? Are you suggesting that in, in one, subsection one? Yeah, um, that would be useful. I mean, I'm, I'm not legally trained, so I don't know how that would be uh -huh. worded to, to, capture, to, to capture all the different actions that could constitute we see another, exploitation. We see it in other acts of Parliament mm -hmm. where there's a kind of catch-all um, which, so you're not hemmed in yeah. by these. Um, Elaine. Yeah, th thanks very much. Can I start by asking whether you, some witnesses last week uh, felt that um, the presumption of against prosecution of victims of trafficking should be on the face of the bill rather than in the guidance from the Lord Advocate. And I just wondered what your, your views on, on that would be. Um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, I think a presumption against prosecution um, would, would be useful and appreciate, though, with the, um, the, the, um, the Lord Advocate has ultimate discretion in these issues, so I'm not sure how that works legally in terms of um, whether that can be a, a presumption in all cases. What I would say with, with children, I would... 
I think the presumption where there's a child involved as a victim which should be strengthened probably more so than, than, than adult victims in terms of the vulnerabilities of children specifically. Um, and also against the non-prosecution of children, I think it's, it's clear that that needs to be much more to the fore in, in, in the bill, on the face of the bill. Yes, if I may. Um, yes, I note the directive allows for options um, which the Scottish Bill has taken, but it might be worth noting that the UK or the Westminster uh, Bill has uh, taken the option of non-prosecuting, and the relevance of that is that this possibly opens up opportunities for serious and organised crime gangs to exploit the differences between the jurisdictions. And certainly when it came to the UK-wide um, Crime International Cooperation Act 2003, the Scottish Parliament at that time was mindful of the fact that organised crime could exploit jurisdictional issues. Thanks. Can I go on to ask you about something which isn't in the bill but was raised with us in writing last week, which says that the, um, the Northern Irish legislation... Uh, criminal, criminalises the purchase of sex and decriminalises the sale of sex and the, the argument was being made that that would reduce some of the demand which, result, which causes human trafficking. I wondered if you had any views on that? Um, yes, I do have views on that. It's really difficult in terms of um, a human trafficking bill because the purchase of sex might also be out with human trafficking. Um, but I know there's many arguments in that respect in terms of whether all types of prostitution is exploitation. Um, I'm not sure within the Human Trafficking Bill it would be the right forum for that, but I think it's something that does need to be looked at more broadly in terms of the exploitation of, of women or, or men through prostitution. Dr Neil, Unfortunately, it's not, prostitution is not my area of expertise, so I won't, I won't, I won't offer a view. <laughs> it's not mine. <laughs> Want to rephrase that, Dr Neil? In, in any particular uh, context. <laughs> I'm quite interested, uh, <laughs> I think, in the point that you were making, that even if, I say, the committee were sympathetic to the arguments presented by uh, some of the other witnesses, whether it is appropriate for it to be in this bill, although, having said that, it is actually in the Northern Irish legislation, so it obviously was felt there to be appropriate to be in that bill. Well, I think, I think mm, you had your yeah, answer yeah. from, from uh, Dr Rigby, and Dr O'Neill has advised us she has no expertise mm -hmm. in this area. So I think right. we'll have you another That's question. fine, no, that's fine. Um, Margaret, followed by John, followed by Roderick. Margaret. Good morning. Um, this is specifically for <coughs> Dr O'Neill. Uh, I noticed that in your written submission you've got a comparative overview of human trafficking, uh, looking at the legislation from Northern Ireland, England and Wales and Scotland. So, broadly speaking, how do these um, different jurisdictional approaches measure up to each other? Well, I think in, in a general viewpoint, all three jurisdictions are trying to do something similar. I think uh, the difference comes down to the detail of, of, of the various provisions. Um, so the intention is, is clearly there. The um, Westminster Bill is more advanced um, than the Scottish Bill in going through uh, Parliament, so the Scottish Bill obviously still has opportunity for revision, and the Northern Ireland Act has now been passed. So I've, I've already had feedback from the Northern Irish Department of Justice on my comments, and they've raised a few issues which I still need to consider and, and reflect upon. Thing that you would like to, to None at this and, point, no. I'm, okay. I'm sure the Scottish Parliament wished to take their own particular viewpoint okay. on, on this um, legislation. I think you, you suggested that perhaps there was a need to revisit the, the issue of consent in the bill. Uh, yes, there, there are certainly issues of consent. Uh, do, do. Um, yeah, I'm... I'm losing my notes here, but I, I understand that their consent should never be given for, uh, by children at any point, and the, the, the lack of reference to children in the current, express reference to children in the current draft is an issue, but also um, there's an issue of when consent can be given if somebody's under extreme duress, e even as an adult, because we are talking about, to the most part, vulnerable people, however that vulnerability may have arisen, and I know some of the feedback has raised that while there will be certain groups of people that may be classified as vulnerable, other people may become vulnerable due to their personal situation, which we cannot always anticipate. Okay. Um, more generally, do you think the bill's well drafted? Are there areas that you know 
you think you could focus on specifically? The, the, there are... There are a few points. Um, I think there's, in, in the version of the bill that I saw, I thought there was a, a discrepancy <coughs> between uh, the human trafficking and modern slavery provisions. I presume you intended to have the same provisions for both. Um, Sorry, I've just asked one Are you talking about the bill as, as lead? Is, yes, the version. So that's, the yeah. bit, that's yeah. right. That's yeah. The, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, cer certainly, yes, the, the consent uh, issue arises there. And also, there's an issue about um, aiding and abetting, or, or as it's known in Scotland, art and part, which I'm not an expert in, but uh, you've covered that for human trafficking, but you don't appear to have covered that for um, slavery, servitude, forced and compulsory labour. I presume you meant to do that. Um, so I, I think you'd need to assure yourself that, that was covered one way or the other. That one four one b says, under slavery, servitude and force... The person requires another person to perform forced or compulsory labour and the circumstances such a person knows or ought to know that the other person is being required to perform such labour. That doesn't cover it? Uh, th that may well do. Part in part? Mm. Yeah. <coughs> Just wondered. Um, if, 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 if you feel it does cover it, yes. But um, you've doubts? Yeah. Um, okay. It, 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 it's, it's what occurred to me when I was reading the bill, but as I say, I'm not a, a Scottish lawyer. Um, also, the establishment of jurisdiction. I did have concern that it, the establishment of jurisdiction in Section 2.2 might not cover persons temp temporarily present in the jurisdiction. For example, um, what about somebody delivering a victim um, along a transnational human trafficking chain into the country? It's very clear about establishing jurisdiction against Scottish nationals and people resident in Scotland. Hmm. Sorry, UK nationals. Rigby, I think you mentioned um, viewing human trafficking through a reductionist list. Um, Elaine, sorry. Um, do you think the, the bill, as, as drafted, sufficiently captures all the complicated issues that are involved within um, human trafficking? That's a good question. Yes, it does capture many issues involved in human trafficking, but I don't think any piece of legislation can be sufficiently nuanced to, to address all of the, the issues that we've come across. I think the point that was made earlier about keeping it sufficiently wide, that, that may be the way forward. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sufficiently legally trained or aware to know how the wording of the bill can cover all those different aspects. I'm particularly interested though that the, the Scottish Bill with the focus on victims is very welcomed in terms of providing the, the support and assistance to, to victims. Unfortunately it does focus on adults and not children but um, the, the issue about um, statutory support for victims is welcome and I think that's an area that hasn't been covered in the past in, in many types of legislation. Thank you, that's helpful. Yeah, I, think, I think we've got the message about the aspects of children being perhaps even a separate section or whatever the drafters can do, an amendment can come into that. Um, John, followed by Roderick, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Good, uh, good morning, panel. It's, it's a couple of questions for yourself, uh, Dr O'Neill, um, and perhaps less technical and covered by your introductory statement where, where, you, t where you say, and I'll quote here, the issue of human trafficking law is almost as diverse. Uh, issues arise in distinguishing human trafficking from human smuggling. Can you tell me what the difference is and I would... Yeah. Please. The main difference is volunteering. Human smuggling is um, wishing to come into the country illegally and paying human smugglers to, um, to facilitate that, and that would be uh, an immigration crime, uh, where the individual crossing the border is, is in fact the criminal. The human trafficking, um, which is sometimes very difficult to distinguish and sometimes as part of a, a continuum you volunteer to be smuggled and then you turn into a human trafficking victim, is where you are now being exploited by people being brought across the border and you're no longer, um, you, you, you're no longer volunteering for what happens next. So, um, and, and in that case, certainly the EU law is clear that... Um, that individual is then a victim, while the criminals are the people who brought you into the country, perhaps part of an organised crime gang, 
um, although it can happen that individuals will be brought in by other individuals. So the, the reality of the situation is it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish between the two, but the laws should be quite different in their operation and, and classifying who is the, the target of the legal framework and law enforcement operation show the level of challenge there are for the authorities as to whether someone is a, a victim yeah, or an it, it is very difficult and certainly the argument would be from the law enforcement community is that those who want to be smuggled into the country may claim to be trafficked um, and the, the EU directive is aware of that because there are also EU provisions on human <coughs> smuggling which we may or may not be involved in in this country being part of the opt-out of Schengen um, but um, uh, individuals may claim to be trafficked. The assumption in the directive is that they should be treated as if they're human trafficking victims until the contrary is proven, and then they may well be criminals um, involved in crossing the border as Ill illegal immigrants, uh, and that's a completely different area of law. Okay, th thank you for that. Uh, something else in your introduction, you make mention of the appointment in uh, 2011 of the Welsh Government's anti-trafficking trafficking coordinator. Are you able to comment on the effectiveness of that role? Um, no, I'm not. Um, and I see that there is, um, a, a, not in great detail, I haven't done a lot of work on, on the Welsh jurisdiction, although I'm aware they do have one, and that Westminster Bill will have one as well, um, for operating for the whole of the UK jurisdiction. And there is a, an anti-trafficking coordinator appointed at a U, EU level mm -hmm. as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, something else that comes up, uh, um, I would still refer the question to yourself, uh, Dr Neil. but uh, in um, Dr Rigby's statement is the, the question of illegal inter-country adoption. Again, there will be complexities around that. Do you believe this legislation could pick up on that, or is it pertinent to that? Um, I think the draft directive did refer to forced adoption and forced marriages, um, possibly marriages of people under the age of 18, um, th there are going to be a lot of complexities in, in the more difficult areas of, of human trafficking. I think we, all that can be expected is the best is done and then it's reviewed later to see if, if there are other areas. I think the point about, while, while having exemplars of how human trafficking might be, having a catch-all phrase may be useful because it's very difficult to anticipate what direction organised crime is going to go in. Um, other jurisdictions have slightly different approaches like forced um, involvement in medical research, I know, is in, is in another jurisdiction. But if you had a catch-all situation, um, that will future-proof the bill or the Act. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask Dr Rigby a, a question that's about two, two comments you've made <coughs> in the statement. And one of them is about uh, child victims of trafficking being treated as many adults and also your comment about the, the role um, of an agency whose primary function, I quote you here, whose primary function is border control, creates a conflict of interest with regard to the child. Could you expand on the issues around that, please, Dr Rigby? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, if, we're, if we're talking about the, the national referral mechanism of way of identifying um, victims of trafficking, um, to date the experience from Scotland would suggest that children, when they're subject to this approach, a lot of interviews... Um, a lot of questions from different, um, different state actors um, and there's no due regard given to the age of that young person in terms of the trauma that they've experienced and to the, um, to the movement or to the, to the lack of movement or their understanding of where they are, etc. So th there's an issue there in terms of under-18s are not many adults, they're, they're children and they have their own sp specific vulnerabilities and needs. So I think that's important to recognise that, that that's what's been happening. Um, and to the second point, in terms of the decision-making within the competent authority, the, the competent authority, as in practice in um, the UK, is not necessarily that that was envisaged in the original um, National Referral Mechanism document of the OSCE, which was a multi-agency grouping or panel that would make decisions on whether somebody had been trafficked, and especially with children, there was a recognition that we needed child protection experts who were involved in that, and that doesn't happen at the moment. And, and the, 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 the annex that, I, that I've put in, in terms of the model that we proposed in Scotland, is recognising that child trafficking has its distinct issues opposed from trafficking in general, and that the child protection system in Scotland, as it stands, albeit with some problems and some issues, 
is probably the best forum for the identification, protection and ongoing support of all children who have been trafficked or exploited. Not taking away, obviously, the reserve decisions for the UK VI make on um, asylum and immigration. Clearly, that would stay with um, UK VI. But any other aspect of exploitation or abuse is clearly within the remit of the statutory authorities in Scotland. And I believe that that's probably the best route to approach working with vulnerable young people, vulnerable children leaving the decision making and the support in the hands of those who are trained and experts in child protection. Would it be your view that UKVI's involvement or the profile or the, where they sit in the pecking order of decision making act, doesn't act in the interests of children as things stand at the moment? Then? I think the evidence from the national monitoring that we completed in 2011 suggests that a lot of the local authorities do consider that that is an issue that um, a referral through the national referral mechanism is, is not in the best interests of children at times in terms of the decision-making focus that is linked too closely to immigration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. If you forgive me, Gil, I'm going to take others who waited first and then I'll take you in because we've got, we're all going all around uh, the subjects. And we can come back to children in a minute. Ro okay, Roderick, followed by Christian, followed by Gil. Thank you, convener. Um, Dr. Neil, if I may, I just wanted to recap slightly on um, your views as protection of victims. Looking at your written submission, I think it seemed to be fairly clear to me that you were taking the view that uh, the policy provisions wouldn't comply with the directive. But from listening to you this morning, I, I got the impression you took the view that uh, there was a bit more latitude and it wasn't quite as clear cut as that. Would you just like to recap? Yeah. Um. If you mean in the non-prosecution yeah. of, of victims, yeah, yeah the, the Ministry of Justice of Northern Ireland pointed an, out an error to me in, in my paper. Uh, so I'm happy to take that particular point on board. I did revisit the directive. Yeah. So the directive does allow for some flexibility, and yeah. my point was that at this point, then, the difference between the jurisdictions. There are some other points um, on the protection of victims or witnesses that might be worth mentioning, like um, access to witness protection programmes. I don't think there's any reference to that in the bill. I know there is a, a UK-wide witness protection programme in Section 82, the Serious and Organised Crime and Police Act 2005. I don't know if that expressly includes or, or after the, the new UK-wide legislation would include um, human trafficking or the slavery um, offences uh, victims. There's also reference in the directive to compensation uh, for victims. Um, again, I'm aware that there's, there's, um, there's uh, compensation schemes uh, operating in Scotland, but whether that would include um, compensation in these two particular crime areas, human trafficking or the slavery um, offences, I'm not sure about that either. These maybe just could be covered in schedules or something like that. Um, I would also be concerned that Section 8 of the Scottish Bill uh, providing uh, support and assistance to victims, whether or not that will be sufficiently robust in ensuring that it does actually happen, although clearly it's the intention of the Parliament that it would do so. Um, just, just back a bit more onto this question of uh, protection of victims. The paragraph 56 of the policy memorandum kind of rejects the idea of a statute defence because it would place a burden on victims to prove the connection between offending behaviour and their traffic status running contrary to the victim-centred approach. I don't know what your view is on that, but looking at the modern slavery bill, that kind of re requirement to prove that connection is fairly clear from um, Section 45 of the modern slavery <coughs> bill. Any comment on that? No, I did read the, the feedback from the Faculty of Advocates and the Edinburgh Bar Association, and I would defer to... Scottish lawyers and the interpretation of, of those particular provisions. It, it obviously depends on how the courts operate in Scotland. Um, another possibility, apart from Lord Advocate's guidelines, is that under Section 12 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act, the Lord Advocate could issue instructions in relation to offences direct to the Chief Constable, um, which might provide an additional line of protection. 
We're at a disadvantage that we don't have a preliminary draft of that, so those provisions may be stronger or weaker than what's anticipated in the directive. There's just a, a lack of information at this <coughs> point on those provisions. Um, perhaps I could just ask an additional question. Uh, independent child trafficking advocates, that's not on the face of the bill. We've heard some evidence that there should be, that should be on the face of the bill. I don't know whether either you, Dr Rigby or Dr O'Neill, got a specific view on that. Yes, I would have a view on that. I think um, with the experience of the guardianship project in, um, in Scotland, um, we've identified that that can be good practice. Um, I think one of the, the major issues which is in the Northern Ireland and the, the, um, the Westminster legislation is whether that needs to be a legal guardian or, or a guardian with the subtle differences. Um, I think my view on that is at the moment a guardian would be sufficient. Um, and we have provision perhaps under Section 11 of the Children's Scotland Act for the um, appointment of a person with legal responsibilities and that's a possibility to, to address the legal issue if there's nobody with parental responsibilities to, for example, to instruct a lawyer. But at the moment, the evidence from the, the guardianship project would suggest that um, a legal guardian is, is not required at this moment in time in Scotland because of the... the, the the, um, the systems that are already in place in terms of protecting and, and working with young people. And in terms of, uh, uh, final point, in terms of the national referral mechanism and uh, the review um, which was received in November, is there any particular aspects that uh, we should take on board in Scotland in looking at the impact of that review? Well, in my opinion, the national referral mechanism is probably not fit for purpose for children. Um, I think there probably needs to be a separate national referral mechanism or equivalent for children in Scotland. There's, there's no requirement to, um, to, to, to follow the national referral mechanism as it is in um, at the rest of the UK. It's, it's a policy decision to, to address it through that route rather than a legislative one. And I think we have the expertise amongst the um, professional population in Scotland that we, for children, that we could um, take the national referral mechanism or equivalent through the child protection process so that the, a multi-agency child protection case conference can make a decision if somebody has been trafficked and then the decision follows in terms of the assistance and the support that is available to the young person. And at that point, if somebody's identified, notification could be sent to UKVI or UKHTC that a young person has been identified as a trafficking victim. And that leaves all the work, all the support, all the identification within the Scottish system, which is, is entirely in keeping with our obligations under the um, EU directive. Thank you. Just a, a short supplementary uh, um, Dr O'Neill, when you said about duty to secure support and assistance, your concerns, whether that be, uh, I'm reading uh, the wording of uh, 8.1, whether a reasonable grounds believe that an adult is a victim of an offence of human trafficking, the Scottish ministers must, during the relevant period, secure for the adult provision of such support and assistance. Now, let's part a bit about children just now, as we think we've accepted that. That's mandatory. Is that not enough? Not, I suppose it will depend how that works in practice. Yeah, well, yeah. yes, everything is how yeah. it works in practice. But I just wondered, this is mandatory and that, you know, that could be founded on uh, by anyone who hasn't yeah. had uh, the assistance required. Thank you. Um, Christian, followed by Gil. Christian. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Dr. O'Neill, I, I wanted to know a bit more about Section 5 and 6 regarding sentencing. Uh, I think you uh, told us in your... Uh, uh, submission that um, the issue of penalties uh, in all UK uh, jurisdictions seems to be diverging from the provision of the EU directive and from each other. What kind of problem that will cause? What will be the remedy? On the sentencing of the actual offences, the, the UK jurisdictions, all three of them are going further than is required by the directive. That doesn't cause me a problem at all. Um, which um, which particular provision came before the divergence bit? Sorry. So I, I have the, the, on the issue of penalties, then 
all UK jurisdictions are diverging from the provision of the directive. Yeah, that, that, but, but that, that. that's not necessarily a negative but, thing. Uh, you say from each other, will, could, could that become a problem, especially I heard you saying early on, uh, the, the problem of having different sentences in different areas in the UK will maybe make part of the UK a soft target compared to, to others? I think in general the UK will not be regarded as a soft target after the, the three um, bills become an act. I think the issue may be in, in the treatment of the victims and uh, the prosecution or non-prosecution of victims, um, which, which we've already covered. Uh, in particular, if the England and Wales jurisdiction is not prosecuting at all and the, the Scottish jurisdiction is prepared to hold victims to account for some crimes, whether that will form part... I, I suppose the concern is whether that will form part of the um, <coughs> inability or, or lack of enthusiasm for the victims to report their crimes or to give evidence, etc., in, in the Scottish jurisdiction. It may have an impact. I understand that. I just wanted to clarify yeah. the point about sentencing, and you clarified it. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, Dr. Rigby, I, I heard you talking about the national uh, referendum uh, mechanism, and you, you are being thoughtful about the point that uh, it's not fit for purpose for children. We had a lot uh, in the evidence that we took, but it doesn't seem to be fit for purpose for adults as well, particularly adults with learning difficulties, uh, people with mental health, and people having a traumatic time, uh, uh, and, and, and the system in place uh, doesn't seem to, uh, to understand that, 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 that point. I would like you to know more about that, maybe uh, 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 saying, do you, uh, do you think that it should be only for children, or do you accept the case that, in fact, is maybe not fit for purpose for everybody? It's certainly problematic with, with, the, with the examples that you've provided, and, and the EU directive is quite clear that some of those issues should be, be given particular attention to. I, mean, I think the problem with the national referral mechanism over the years, it's been too closely aligned with the immigration system, and I, th I think that's the key problem. Um, per se, a national referral mechanism, and it comes down to the, the point that's already been mentioned, it's, it's not necessarily unfit for purpose. It's the, it's the devil's in the detail of the implementation of that. And at the moment, because the decision-making process is located um, in England, it's away from the provisions of support and assistance in, in Scotland that we have. Um, one, of the, one of the main concerns that I've had over the years with the National Referral Mechanism, it's relying on the victim status to be conferred on somebody by um, a separate body, as opposed to the fact that they are a victim of trafficking. And we're waiting for somebody to make a, a relevant decision on that. And it's, it's very rare in, the, in this area that you would see that we have to wait for a, a specific decision from a, an outside body that somebody's a victim. If somebody's a victim of trafficking, they're a victim of trafficking, no matter what any external agency will say. Um, and the example was, was given um, last week in evidence in terms from victim support. If, if, there was, if, if a rape victim approached somebody and said to support services that I'm a victim of rape, they wouldn't be saying, you have to prove that before we will provide any support. And I think the national referral mechanism is in danger of relying on a single agency to make these decisions about people, whether they are victims or not. So the, you know, it, it valid the point, but it's as much as for children than for adults. And on that particular point, the difference between children and adults, if, uh, uh, if, if the bill is changed and we have a statutory uh, uh, requirement having guardianship for children, uh, then the imbalance will maybe be for, uh, for adults who will not have that kind of protection. I'm talking about people who've been uh, trafficking, come, who have English is not their first language, la 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 like mine, they maybe not have that help. But children, if you get that statutory uh, guardianship, so maybe the spirit of the bill not focusing on children, but trying to keep it as open as possible, and particularly in regard to the national referral uh, mechanism, is maybe the best way to go about it, or you still think we should have a special uh, a, a difference made for children? I think it's clear within directive we have to have special provision for children. Um, articles um, 13 to 16 are quite clear the, the special vulnerabilities for children. I, I actually, I take your point about guardianship for, for adults. That would probably be welcomed as well. 
At the moment, it doesn't seem to be the case that that is an issue. But for children specifically, the, the guardianship project or the guardian, but located in an integrated child protection system is key. The guardians on their own will not be able to protect children. It's the integrated system of child protection that's key. Um, across the EU at the moment, there's, there's a move towards child-sensitive integrated child protection systems, and that, that's going to be key, not, not a specialist expertise in trafficking. Trafficking has to be brought into the broader child protection agenda, and the, the point was made earlier, exploitation happens out with the remit of the trafficking description. We have child abuse, child sexual exploitation, um, and all these are dealt with generally under the child protection system, and there's no reason why child victims of trafficking should not be part of that system in terms of the child-sensitive approach, the child-centred approach. And to finish off, regarding the national referral uh, uh, mechanism, do you think um, it should be, it's been reviewed already, uh, but do you think we should have um, a different one for Wales, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, and, and Wales and England, Northern Ireland and Scotland? Do you think there is a, because the, this legislation will be different, uh, for, for different jurisdictions, should we have a different national referendum mechanism, or maybe uh, ha this bill will be superseding some some of the effects of the national referral mechanism? I, I, can, I can speak from my experience in, in Scotland. Um, I think it's quite possible to have a national referral mechanism in Scotland, and especially for children located in the child protection system. I think the evidence is there from um, the work that's been done in Glasgow over the years that if the child protection system is working around that child, the protection offered is greater than it would be for any one single service or any one single agency making these decisions. And I think I, think I can really only speak from the Scottish perspective and my experience. Locating it within child protection is the key, although we have to acknowledge there's been problems with that in the past and... There has to be training, development associated with that. But the, the national referral mechanism, as it stands at the moment, does not really serve Scotland's children. And some of the adults as well, you would recognise. Oh, and adults as well, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Bill? Thanks for asking me. Dr. Wright, you, you mentioned something you said, many adults, that uh, often children are treated the same as adults. In Scotland, particularly this parliament, we have spent an awful lot of time providing services for children, peculiar services, se different services, if you like. Uh, it's in the health service, it's within the court system, and it's within social work. And But most of the people coming forward are saying that, in this case, that you would like to see children embedded in this bill, by the sound of it, which goes against what we've been trying to achieve, and yet we have a very, very robust system under all circumstances for children. I was going to leave this question for COSLA because they, they brought some evidence in this regard. So I wondered if, if you had an opinion on that. Are we not by incorporating children in the way that some people are suggesting, do, do the very thing by treating them like many adults? Is there a danger in that happening? Um, with all due respect, I think that we, we required under the E directive to in, include children in, in, in any bill. I, I fully take your point. Within Scotland, we have an excellent system that identifies children. If you look at the policy around GERFEC, et cetera, um, across health, education and social work, um, I wouldn't disagree that we do have a very good system. I don't think mentioning children on the face of this bill will negate that in any way whatsoever. What it will do is, is strengthen our obligations or our commitment to the, to the EU directive, and it will identify children as specific victims with their own specific vulnerabilities and needs, but different to adults that then can locate it within the child protection system. So I, I would fully agree that we, we do have a system in Scotland that identifies children as different, but at the moment, what we're experiencing across, across the UK, but especially in Scotland, is that children, through the present system for the national referral mechanism, are often treated as, as many adults, and their specific vulnerabilities are not being met by services. Um, there needs to be... It needs to be a link on the face of the bill, I believe, to the, to the existing legislation, which is strong. But at the moment, we know from experience that local authorities, statutory bodies, are not always fulfilling their duties towards children once they've been identified. And I think that's the key part, to recognise child victims of trafficking within the broader remit of a trafficking offence or a trafficking definition, 
but then locating them in terms of support and assistance within the child protection system that largely is the best place to protect the children in Scotland. Oh, yes, sorry. Don't sorry, you. just one more point on, on children before we leave that point. Uh, the directive does have provisions that um, domestic laws <coughs> should, should ensure that it's possible for a prosecution to be taken uh, for a sufficient period of time after the victim reaches the age of majority, and I think that bit's also missing from the draft bill. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, this session concluded, and I'm going to suspend for five minutes. Thank you very much for your evidence, both written and oral, this morning. Five minutes, 11:25. Um, we kick in again. Thank you.
now um, about to start our next session. Can I welcome Jenny Mara uh, to the committee? And I welcome our second panel of witnesses, Lorraine Cook, Migration, Population and Diversity Team of COSLA, and Katie Cosgrove, Gender-Based Violence Programme, NHS Health Scotland. And I thank everyone for their submissions, and I invite questions from members Margaret, Christian, Elaine. Thank you. Yeah. Alison. Good morning. Um, this is a question first for COSLA. I notice you um, raised the issue of training awareness for trafficking. Could you tell me what's in place just now in local authorities and what you would propose to improve this awareness raising? I think there's, there's a range of different practice across, um, across all local authorities um, and it's, it's very diverse. Um, for example, there was a lot of raising awareness in Falkirk um, around human trafficking um, where they set up a, a, a stall um, in the shopping centre. So there, there has been different aspects of awareness raising. Um, Glasgow, of course, is your example of good practice in terms of Tara is based there um, and also in terms of the child protection system um, and their models around trafficking and um, the work they've done with the uh, way back pilot in the London Safeguarding um, Children project as well and how they've built on that. So there is a diversity of different um, areas that they've been work that, that work has been going on with. Uh, how do you see the bill helping this? In terms of um, in terms of COSLA, we have taken papers to leaders. Our first paper went in 2006, um, and it was really get garnering support from leaders of all 32 local authorities in terms of um, making Scotland a hostile environment for human traffickers um, and promoting the agenda that that agenda of anti-human trafficking. Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I read as well. <laughs> yeah, how the bill would improve the arrangements. I mean, what would help you from the bill's oh, provision? Oh, yes. <laughs> Get right into Glasgow, do you think? <laughs> so so, so there, there, there is a real support. I think in terms of um, the training um, and awareness raising, we see um, different areas of local government that are crucial in this. Um, in terms of awareness raising, many frontline services um, and officers. We're looking at regulatory officers um, in terms of environmental health, um, housing as well, trading standards, um, licensing. So that sort of um, awareness raising um, and training would be crucial. Um, but also, of course, in terms of child protection systems and um, getting that good practice that's harnessed in Glasgow um, across across Scotland um, and I think that it's really the strategy that we're looking at is the basis of looking at how that sort of training and awareness raising would be crucial and how we can develop it within within the strategy. They're focused on raises the awareness and highlights it flags it up if you like yes. to these various departments. Yeah. Can yeah. I also ask um, Ms. Golfgrove, uh, not just local government, I would imagine the health service in its various forms may also come across victims of, of trafficking. Is there a, a, awareness raising tra uh, training within the NHS? Yeah, there is. I think um, clearly the NHS is a pivotal organisation in identification of, of human trafficking and it's one which is a fairly new issue for the health service I think in recent years primarily because the focus has been predominantly on law enforcement and immigration in the past so it's relatively recently I think that we've taken a victim centre to approach this issue. The health director issued a chief executive's letter in 2012 and we produced guidance for all health staff on identifying and responding sensitively to potential victims of trafficking and that included guidance on how to record and how to report um, information around that. Since then we've developed a suite of resources for staff including an e-learning module on human trafficking that each health board has made available to its staff and we've so far in the year or so that it's been available, had over a thousand members of staff using that. The issue of human trafficking has been aligned with the wide agenda-based violence programme within the Health Directorate, 
Um, and that means that we can use the infrastructure that we have in place for the gender-based violence programme across health boards to support the dissemination of materials and to support the uptake of training. Um, one of the difficulties for an issue like this, in, in common with other issues like forced marriage, FGM and so on, is that we can't release thousands and thousands of staff to go to bespoke training on one particular issue. So what we've looked at doing is incorporating it within the existing body of training. Um, there's training in gender-based violence across all health board areas in Scotland, and a number of health boards have looked quite proactively at how they ensure that staff are aware of this issue and whom to contact um, should they need to make a referral. Stuff quite um, comfortable with the, the the distinction which Tara has said is often blurred between immigration, between smuggling, between trafficking. It's difficult to say the extent to which people appreciate the difference. Certainly, that's been highlighted in the in the guidance. What I think um, is more of an issue for staff is what they do when they uncover a, a case of potential trafficking. Um, the health di director has made it quite clear that potential victims of trafficking have access to free health care, so we don't have a resource issue in that respect. Um, I think the difficulty for staff um, is understanding the measures that they can take that wouldn't jeopardise the potential safety or protection of victims, and I think that's probably an area where there's less comfort and confidence rather than distinctions between smuggling and immigration and trafficking. But the, the thing you did probably raise was Section 8, that if um, you're a victim of trafficking, <coughs> then Section 8 doesn't apply because you haven't been subject to the, the national referral mechanism process. I think one of the concerns that we have around the way that the, the language in which Section 8 is couched is that it does very much evoke... Um, the national referral mechanism. From a health point of view, what we've tried to encourage staff to do is to see potential victims of trafficking as one, uh, as people who need immediate care and assistance and assessment. So what we would like that to do, I think, is remove some of the, the potential ambiguity in that section so that it's clear for staff that anyone who's a potential victim of trafficking has access to immediate support and assistance. And I would, you know, su support the previous submissions about strengthening the requirement for psychological assistance um, and support in that because I think the existing provisions around counselling are fairly weak. Okay, thank you. Just clarify, you say staff, do you include GPs in that? Because they're not really NHS staff. No, they're part of the healthcare system. There's, I suppose, really what I mean are healthcare so, professionals across the NHS, whether or not they're independent thank you very contractors much. Thank or you. not. Yeah. Uh, Jenny. From the convener's point, I'm um, co-convener of the cross-party group on human trafficking here in the Parliament. And just a few months ago, um, a GP from Newcastle travelled up to attend our cross-party group. Um, and she came because uh, she had had victims of human trafficking attend her surgery, her doctor's surgery. And I just wanted to ask, and I th think this fits in with the first part of the bill, convener, about strategy. Because the way the, the bill is constructed is that the Scottish Government will be able to present a three-year strategy that will then um, give them a programme of work to, to help with awareness raising and training. Is the, is the NHS training, um, you said it's available to, to all staff, and I understand you can't release staff willy-nilly because you know, they have jobs to do. Um, however, is it, is it targeted at perhaps areas of the health service that are perhaps most likely, not exclusively, but most likely to see trafficking victims, perhaps such as GPs or in our uh, genital urinary clinics or, or places like that? We have, um, as part of the gender-based violence programme, we've, we've taken exactly that approach. Um, so we do target areas of primary care, um, such as GPs, health visitors. We also look at maternity, mental health and sexual health services. And those are the same areas that we have identified as being of primary importance in ensuring that there's awareness raising and training around human trafficking. So yes, we would do that. Um, there's an, a number of measures, for example, um, attempts to improve the situation of women involved in indoor prostitution that's ongoing at the moment that would obviously dovetail with some of the measures that were taken around human trafficking. And part of the training for staff in that would also encompass um, awareness of human trafficking. Can I ask Lorraine Cook a similar question, convener? Is that OK? Well, well, or do you want to come back to me? In first yeah, absolutely. Come back to you. Can I just clarify, <coughs> gender-based, it's only women and girls. Is what happens to young men um, in the circumstances? What has the NHS got there for young men who are being... Gender-based violence doesn't only um, encompass provision for women and girls. The use of that descriptor, I think, is... Um, 
across the NHS is used to identify okay. the very gendered nature of the different forms of abuse, but provision is also um, made available for boys and men who experience those different That's forms That's very of helpful, because you talked about women. I just was concerned that we were missing out the other bit. Christian, followed by Elaine, Alison, and then back to Jenny. Uh, no, Roddy comes in after Alison. Then, Roddy, you need to wave your hand higher for me. Thank right. you very much, Kavina. Uh, yes, uh, reading uh, your uh, submission, Kozla, I, I just wanted to know a little bit more about the services that uh, you provide for child victims in terms of, of trafficking, and particularly your views and the. Uh, you agree with the Scottish Government that the existing support services for children are sufficient and do not need to be enhanced through the bill. So can you talk us more about that? <clears throat> I think for us um, there's a whole plethora of legislation in terms of child protection um, and that uh, I think it's crucial that it's embedded in the child protection system. I think our fear is if there's such a clarity, there's a, a somehow a separate system, if you like, for children that have been trafficked, that it's not embedded into the child protection system um, as a, a, a somehow a separate system um, with separate needs when they're, they're so much um, entwined, if you like. So it's not just a child has been trafficked. It could be um, child sex exploitation. There's a whole... Um, um, needs um, surrounding the child that are best placed in the child protection system and the legislation that, that builds on that, that system. Do you, you think that the, the legislation is strong enough already and you yeah. think that putting anything in the bill could maybe weak, weaken a little bit what, what we have already? Um, I think for us uh, there, there is strong legislation in terms of child um, protection system. It is around training and awareness raising of all these elements of the legislation, how it fits in with children that have been trafficked that may need, that needs to be rolled out. Um, and I think that is a place for the strategy. If you talk about the services that you have for uh, children who have been trafficked, <coughs> trafficking is only comes second or third in the list of, of what the service you you, 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 you provide it's not it's not the most important point I think it would depend on <laughs> the, the the case it's it's looking at the child in a holistic yeah. holistic view rather than um, staggering what's the most so important and yeah it's, so it's what I'm trying to say sorry I didn't express myself properly <laughs> it's, yeah. it's that if we put it in the, in the act in the bill uh, it could maybe end up being at the top of the agenda when it shouldn't be maybe on the way you deliver your services. It's only part of it. Yeah, or, or there's somehow, if you like, it takes away from it not being embedded into the <laughs> child protection system. So it's, yeah, that, that somehow is a separate. What's your view on the, on the guardianship, as a, the, the proposal for guardianship and, the, on the, and as a statutory uh, requirement in the bill? Um, I think the the, the, the guardianship model that's going on just now do incredibly good work. Um, I think for us, it, it's um, the, the, the service should be put into the strategy as it's not covering all children that have been trafficked. Um, you're talking about unaccompanied. Uh, so it's one aspect of the, the group, if you like, of victims of trafficking. So if we're looking at... Um, children that are being internally trafficked um, and suffer, well, child sexual exploitation, that the guardianship model is more for unaccompanied, um, whereas I think the named person um, and the Children and Young People Act do, do cover all um, potential child victims of trafficking. I think we've got already this kind of guardianship system. Um, no, I think the the um, the guardianship model does play a, a, an important role for particular um, child victims of trafficking. Not see it on the on the on the bill. Yeah, as, as it, it, I would say it was more a matter to be um, defined, if you like, in the strategy. And I know that it differs between the cause line and the NHS. Maybe uh, Ms. Koskov wants to say something about that? Uh, no, I think um, 
We haven't made particular reference to children in our submission. We focus on very much on adult services in relation to human trafficking and at a local level have engaged very much within the, the local child protection systems to support um, the identification and, and assistance for children. But you did say that uh, 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 you stated that the bill would benefit for providing guardians with legal powers in line with common sense legislation in Northern Ireland. Yes, I think the I think the evidence would support that that provision. Yes, but you wouldn't be against the proposal of COSLA to have it in guidance or in strategy, more than to have it in the. I think probably we would need to look more at the evidence in terms of whether um, the benefits would outweigh the, um, the difficulties in, in doing that. I think we certainly do need to strengthen the provisions around child guardianship um, to support victims, child victims of trafficking, yes. So you say the jury is out knowing if it should be in the <laughs> <or> not. <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think there, is, there are certainly merits in, in, in the inclusion of that and certainly the evidence would support it. Um, I think perhaps COSLA are focusing much more in the, on the local implementation. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Can just, just for can you remind me the age limit for named person? I'd have to go back. No, I've I, I got a feeling, you see, that it won't be the age range 16 to 18. I may be wrong. And we were looking at, you know, 18 and under presumptions yeah. of being mm -hmm. a child and so on. So I don't think... Can you help me out there? I'm I just wondering... Come here, or is it not that it's a child someone up to 16 or between 16 and 18? That's what I think, yes. Yeah. So I think we've got but, that gap. But, but, no. When you refer to the named person, <laughs> no, we'd you, fulfil it. I beg no. your pardon. Yeah, no. I'm getting evidence here from John. Yes, John. No, well, my understanding is it <coughs> used to be up to 16 or between 16 and 18 of the subject of uh, compulsory measures. Yes, but the, the use of the term <coughs> named person, maybe just check yeah. that, because you, you were using the role of named person yeah. uh, as, as in guardian at uh, some extent. I, I don't know if that covers... Um, that, that, that group, particularly when we've got difficulties over age, um, with, um, people perhaps can't speak English, can't communicate in English and so on, and have no documentation. Uh, I move on to Lane, Alison, then... Who's this? Roderick and then Jen. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not picking on Roderick, it's my handwriting. <laughs> it's Elaine, Alison, Roderick, then Jenny. <laughs> Elaine. Uh, just, just to expand a little bit more on... Um, those particular issues, because there does seem to be a divergence in terms of your written evidence to us. Um, NHS Scotland, you said in your written submission that it might be useful at least to signpost the legislation uh, wh which provides support to children, not necessarily in saying that uh, you have to define it in great detail on the face of the bill, but the actual uh, the legislation which covers children should be signposted. I think what we felt in reading the in reading the draft of the bill was that um, although it ostensibly covers children and adults, there is very little mention of children in it. Um, and I think it, that those provisions could be strengthened to ensure that that cross reference is made if if there isn't the will to include stronger provisions within the actual bill itself. Signposting rather than, I mean, would that cause you problems if it was... No, no, no. no I mean, it's all in um, the legislation that was um, mm. mentioned, the policy memorandum anyway, so... I mean, I suppose the government may argue that it's not necessary because it's already the, ready there and all, but on the balance, do you think it would be helpful to have that cross-referencing actually um, on the bill? Yep, yeah, I think, think for us it's really the strategy that would pick that apart and look at each piece of legislation and the relevance in, in terms of this subject. Mm. Mm. Um, can I also ask about um, the non-prosecution of victims? Certainly uh, NHS Scotland was suggesting that um, Section 7 ought to be strengthened and in fact made uh, reference to Jenny Maher's uh, proposed bill and some of the, the um, uh, wording of that, which is if they f you feel would, would strengthen it. I wondered if you want to say anything more around your reasons to why you think that should be more expressed on the bill rather than being in the guidance from Lord Advocate? I think some of it was around um, clarifying some of the means um, by which people are trafficked and um, and the sense was that, um, that identifying those specific areas that had been outlined before would be clearer, would give a clearer indication of the circumstances in which there would be known prosecution. Okay. Um, and finally, just with the independent guardians, I think you felt that we, we could have, uh, we could maybe, but the bill could maybe benefit from the 
Northern Ireland ex example um, of their legislation with regard to independent guidance, particularly for separated children. So, in a sense, it's not quite the same as, as the named person. This is actually the requirements of children who have no support within this country. Yes, we again, we, we thought the, the wording of the bill um, could be strengthened by inclusion of that provision. Yeah. I don't really quite see how the named, named person concept would actually cover those children who yeah. come into the come into the country with nobody else mm -hmm. who can assist them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know with this, we do need to be more specific about what sort of support that they require yes okay um alison just to return to how um adequate the provisions in the draft bill are around about support and recovery services um you touched on, on the issue of counselling and the fact that that was maybe not the most appropriate thing. I wondered if you could elaborate a bit more around the needs for um, psychological assessment and treatment of victims. I think um, the, we have a growing, quite considerable, but growing body of evidence about the adverse health consequences of human trafficking, but not just at the point of destination, throughout the entire process, the, the different cycles of trafficking. Um, so we have a number of individuals who are coming to the country who have experienced adversity and hardship in their, in their country of origin. Um, a recent study in, in Europe, for example, showed that around 60% of women trafficked for sexual exploitation had some experience of physical or sexual harm in their own country before coming. So we have people who are arriving who may have pre-existing health conditions or who have experienced trauma already um, and are exposed to further harm in the process of being trafficked. Um, we felt that in the provisions that were available in the bill that that hadn't actually been reflected adequately um, and that counselling for people in those sorts of circumstances who may have complex PTSD, who have extremely high levels of depression and anxiety and, and high levels of somatic difficulties aren't adequately covered by counselling and in terms of best practice advice, we would look for a much more thoroughgoing psychological assessment of that. That's very helpful, thank you very much. Is it also important that, there's, that, that um, support and, and recovery service is not time limited? Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the, I'm sure you've heard, heard evidence in this already in relation to the NRM, but one of the difficulties for that process um, and one of the impediments for, for people going through that or going in, in, entering into that process um, is the extreme levels of psychological distress and harm that they already have experienced um, that doesn't make, that, get, that makes the provision of informed consent very difficult to give. Um, and it's very difficult when you look at the litany of abuse that people have suffered, the exposure to hazardous working conditions, living conditions, the exposure to infectious diseases, the, the potential for the existence of chronic or acute medical conditions for them to enter freely into a process which is time limited. Mm -hmm. So from the point of view of their health and, and social welfare, we would um, support the provisions that were outlined in the, the memorandum for the bill that it should be a needsless process. That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Roderick, followed by Jenny. Roderick. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, morning. In the, the consular submission, paragraph <coughs> 9, there's a reference to the question of vulnerability, which I took to mean a reference to the way the bill describes vulnerability in section 4 in fairly limited terms. You then, I think, refer to article 2 of the directive, which says a position of vulnerability means a situation in which the person concerned has no real or acceptable alternative but to submit to the abuse involved and for the need to, for work to be undertaken to ensure all services are fully aware of this additional definition. Can you just perhaps elaborate on what that work is and, and perhaps a view about whether or not um, a clearer definition of vulnerability should be on the bill? Um. This, this was actually, we sent this out to um, all our local authorities and it came back from um, Dundee. And I know Dundee has done a huge amount of work, um, particularly the Violence Against Women Partnership. And I think this was their um, particular concern about a, an understanding of vulnerability um, and, and the, a wider meaning of vulnerability. So, in terms of frontline services, understanding. Yeah, am, am, am I taking it that, some, that the bill should have a definition of vulnerability on it? I'm assuming that that's what you yeah. believe. But yeah. yeah. Um, 
can I can come back to you because I know who sent us um, the response from Dundee, and I could get much more detail from them. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, that's no problem. Yeah, because yeah, we did get a, a wide. Um, yes. That was my point. Okay. Thank you, can be here. Yeah. Gil? Some of the points I was going to raise with you have already been covered, so I, I'm not, I'm not going to go through that again. Uh, they've been adequately covered. But one point that Cosler raised with, was with regards to the Commissioner, who it's a reserve matter, the Commissioner. And I know you've got concerns and you're asking uh, that the, the Scottish Government take action to in, ensure that this jurisdiction is covered. Um, since we've got different laws in Scotland, I, I wonder if you had a, if there was a different approach to that. Maybe a Scottish Commissioner might be the answer yeah. to this, because we've heard in evidence people are concerned with the Commissioner might be too concentrated in, uh, in England, to be quite frank with you. Um, we, we've not um, we've not argued for a specific Scottish commissioner, and I know in the bill um, I can see the benefits of information sharing, um, best practice sharing, and in terms of cost. Um, to, to 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 be fair, but I think it, it has to be. Um, it's crucial that there's a Scottish perspective within that commissioner's remit and a clear Scottish um, perspective that, re that reflects our concerns, our issues. Um, maybe so maybe it's a, a, a see once it's rolled out. <laughs> yeah, might there actually be a benefit in having one commissioner, but maybe an office in, in Scotland, uh, so it's well connected, because I think the one thing we, we, we do know that the people that are involved in this are, are well kitted out They've got more resources than uh, than we have uh, collectively in the world. It would seem they can throw all sorts of money at this. So maybe a good idea would be to have one commissioner uh, and maybe an office in Scotland that would look at us in, in particular. Would that maybe answer I, your concerns? I don't think we would argue against that at all, no. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that. Just, I'll just take Jenny, uh, just to say the name person is up to age 18. The elves have told me so. So, Jenny. Thanks, uh, convener. Um, I wanted to ask Lorraine from, from COSLA on... Um, I wasn't absolutely clear on the guardianship stuff earlier. <coughs> Why wouldn't COSLA want... I mean, you talked about the excellent word, work that the Scottish Guardianship Service does. Why wouldn't COSLA want that to be available in law to victims of trafficking, child victims of trafficking? Our, our concern is, um, if we're talking about a, a guardianship, are we talking about all um, child victims of, of, of trafficking? Um, d is there a need um, for guardians for all, for example, um, internal trafficking that, that's occurring? I, I think it's... A niche. We, we don't have a strong, <laughs> I'm not saying we, but it, it, I think it's more in place for the strategy and in terms of um, explaining, defining what children would come under that particular um, system. That was, but we don't, it's... You don't? No, um, so it, I think, it, yeah, we thought it would be preferable for it to be in the strategy in terms of it is for in, not in, but a particular group of vulnerable, um, unaccompanied child trafficking. I mean, uh, maybe just mine would be that if, if a child has been identified as having been trafficked and without someone to look after them and they're on Scottish soil, then absolutely our local authorities should give them the legal protection of our Scottish guardianship mm -hmm. service. And that's why I'm a wee bit confused as to why COSLA seems resistant to put that to put that into law. Um, it's not it's not a resistance and local authorities do work very well with the guardianship um, model that's going on right now. Um, so no, it's not a resistance. We just thought it should be placed in the strategy in terms of because it's for a very particular or are we looking at it as for so would child. COSLA be um, would you be warmer to the proposal of putting it into law if we were specific so, in that yeah, law about which groups definition. of children it would apply to? Yes. yes. Okay. I think there would be. It becomes a lot more complex if we're talking about a guardian, and and 
um, a guardianship model for all children that have been trafficked. So if we're talking about... Ch I think we're looking at unaccompanied uh, children that you can identify as having no one to represent yes, them. That's, I think that's, that's the point you're making, yes. Yes, yes. That's, yeah, that's so fine. Is it, is it possible that because I would change the position on this if there was, if there was more clarity in the bill as to as to who that guardianship would apply yeah. to. Um, and also I can take that back right. to our um, Child Protection Network and get feedback on that as okay. well. That that's, that's, um, Thank you. Thank you. Right, that ends that session. Thank you very much. I'm going to suspend, and I think the Minister's not available yet. He's to come in a few minutes. So I'm going to clear the public area, please, and so I can have a little chat to the committee. Let's speak to
Um, right, we are now back in business, and uh, item two, suborn legislation, is consideration, first of all, of an affirmative instrument, the Draft Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014, Consequential Provisions Order 2015. Welcome to meeting Paul Wheelhouse, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, and Scottish Government officials. Good afternoon. Uh, Hazel Dalgard and Alistair Smith, Director of Legal Services. And this is, of course, an evidence session. And the wonderful words, I understand that the Minister does not need an opening statement. <laughs> Very welcome. You've made friends immediately. I'll go straight to questions from members. <laughs> but they're still rattling through their papers. Uh, well, I'll ask the question then. I think this follows, uh, interestingly, on the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act 2015. And, um, oh, that's the next one. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Oh, I'm too fast, yes. Courts reform, sorry, consequential provision. Have we any questions? Seems to me there aren't any questions. Right. Um, I move to item three, invite the Minister to move. Motion S4M12522. The Justice Committee recommends the Draft Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014, Consequential Provisions Order 2015 be approved. I formally move, can be No members wish to speak. I take it. And the question is that this motion S4M12522 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. And I think that's these officials now... Um, Stay. I need to suspend. A good job I have. I have my prompt and cue to my left. <laughs> yes, it's you, yes. It's unsettled, you convener. Don't, Sorry. don't make that as any kind of uh, in inducement to do it on other occasions, just to fill the gap. Um, Right. Now we move on to um, item four. Uh, it's consideration of the draft advice and assistance, assistance by way of representation Scotland Amendment number two regulations 2015. I've got the minister still and I've got uh, Alistair. Sm oh, I've got different people. They're both the same. I've got Katrina McKenzie here. And Katrina McKenzie, where is she? Oh, there you, you've got Hazel Dalgard in front of you. This is unfair. I can confuse myself without the assistance of labels. Right. Um, I want to take evidence of this now. This is an evidence session. This is quickly falling apart, but I now know I'm on to the one that was interesting, which I can ask you about, Minister, which is this uh, Counter-Terrorism and Security Act 2015 just re received royal assent last month. And, it, I mean, it's quite draconian in respects. I'm not saying that's a bad thing or a good thing, but it's quite draconian to stop people travelling overseas to fight for terrorism organisations, to engage in terrorism-related activity, and it takes away their travel documents and has temporary exclusion orders. So if I could just ask you, Minister, why we require a bore in, in these circumstances? Uh, we, we know from uh, UK government sources that there's 550 uh, citizens of the UK abroad um, in Syria, uh, or have, have travelled to Syria um, to uh, potentially participate in the activities there, the, this, the, the, the war that's going on in Syria, of whom about half have returned. Uh, up to now, there's not been a provision uh, to prevent the travel uh, of those individuals either returning into the UK uh, or indeed to uh, take their passports off them on a temporary basis uh, where there's a suspicion they've been involved in such activity uh, to avoid them travelling again. So um, this, uh, it's important to say this provision that we're discussing today is to ensure that in the circumstances where someone is presented with the removal of their passport or travel documents, they have access to legal uh, support um, more quickly than perhaps would be possible if they had to wait to apply through the normal legal aid process. So uh, by taking this step, we enable them through their solicitor to have uh, you know, rev relatively quick support to, to be able to address the issue. It's a kind of appeal procedure, is it? Or um, it's, it's, it's to allow a situation where, you know, obviously, if there, if there was potential for retention of travel documents for an initial period, maybe of 14 days, it's possible to extend to 30 days, or a temporary exclusion order, which might prevent an individual from returning to UK, they would be able to access uh, legal support far more quickly than, than would be the case if they had to. They could apply for legal aid, of course. It's, it's certainly the provisions of the bill itself. Um, would entitle people to, uh, if they were uh, taking forward a, a, either a criminal case or indeed uh, in, in a civil process, would be entitled to legal aid, but it would take some time 
to get that into place, and therefore this allows them to access it through the uh, the, the provisions uh, far more quickly. Yeah, John. Thank you, um, Minister. I think the, the UK government is guilty of rank hypocrisy in relation to this particular issue, having initially probably commended some of the people um, uh, who, who, who did uh, go to fight. I, I, for one, would don't want anyone to go abroad to fight for anyone. Um, the, so, whilst, uh, the, as the convener says, this is um, seen as draconian, I, I certainly welcome the fact that draconian legislation has the right, uh, the, the, the mechanism put in place to assist someone my concern is that in relation, once again, in relation to um, the issue of uh, consultation, we're told that the turnaround and the speed of this doesn't facilitate that. And whatever the issue, and I, and I think the, the UK government's got itself confused as to who the goodies and baddies are. They've switched, switched their minds a few times in relation to, to, to issues in the Middle East. It's never good to have legislation made with such speed that there can't be due consideration. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Well, there's always... Uh, uh, a risk um, associated with um, a speedy process and, and clearly uh, we, we recognise that the UK Government and the Ministry of Justice have seen the need for, for urgent legislation and um, uh, we're trying to do our best to support that process and make sure it is done as smoothly as possible. In an ideal world, obviously, we'd have liked to have had more time to consult with, uh, with uh, stakeholders. Clearly, we made the Legal Aid Board aware of um, what we were doing and uh, the Law Society were made aware of the draft um, uh, provisions being laid uh, before Parliament. So they had the ability to, to obviously bring anything they were concerned about to the attention of the committee. Uh, so, um, you know, we've done the best we can in the circumstances, but ideally, I appreciate that clearly we want to have time to, to allow Parliament to have proper scrutiny and to, to go through the normal process, but unfortunately, on this occasion, it wasn't possible. Yeah, for, for the avoidance of doubt, I wasn't critical of you or, or your officials, but once again, we're being reactive rather than having any say on what we would ultimately react to. Uh, well, in an ideal world, as I say, we would like to have had more time ourselves, but you know, we've, uh, we feel we've, uh, we've done the best we can in the circumstances, and I appreciate the point Mr Finney has made that it's, it's not addressed to the Scottish Government. Uh, I appreciate the UK Government equally is in a difficult position wanting to, uh, to put measures in place quickly to deal with what they see as a very uh, risky situation. Um, and we're just doing our best in terms of making it sure it happens as smoothly as possible. Well, it's a welcome response from the Scottish Government. Thank you. Thank you. Roderick. With that wishing to be too difficult, Minister, good, good uh, afternoon. The, afternoon. The financial effect of this bill, the estimate of less than 10,000 per annum, uh, is, is there any magic to that or is this something that's just been considered in the, given the time constraints? Um, well, the issue is, uh, uh, perhaps let's see if a um, uh, colleague wishes to come in just in briefly on this issue, but um, the, uh, certainly something I looked at as well, because the, the numbers are relatively modest, so I wanted to be sure that uh, I understood where they came, came from. Uh, we believe, obviously, of the 550, as I say, about half the people that have left the country to, to go to Syria have, we believe, returned to the UK already. Um, the UK uh, Government Ministry of Justice have taken into account a number of factors in building their estimate, which they have informed us of, uh, that they believe uh, the proportion of cases that would actually uh, be in Scotland works out around 4% of the total there where there might be civil proceedings involved. So that's 4% of 100, and therefore um, we've based our costing on that. Uh, we have looked at the consequences if we were the higher figure, and we believe that um, you know, even if we were to double it, the proportion of UK population in, in Scotland, uh, perhaps to match the 8.5% uh, or thereabouts that we have, uh, we would be looking at an estimate cost of around 12,000 to 16,000 to the Legal Aid Fund. So it's not a huge huge expense we anticipate, but clearly we'll keep these matters under under uh, uh, observation, and if there were to be an issue, we'd raise that with, uh, with colleagues in Parliament. If, so, if I might come in just to clarify, the, the figures that are given with the instrument are in relation to the cost of the changes that we are making specifically, so yeah. the figures are specifically in relation to the two types of proceedings that are, are specified so, in the so instrument. So there is, is some magic to it. <laughs> Not sure if I describe it as magic, but there's certainly some thinking behind it. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Elaine. Just, uh, just for information, really, in terms of, and it, and it does relate to the cost, so I just wondered which court you would imagine yeah. these proceedings would be heard in. If I could maybe pass my colleague yeah. on that one. Or that maybe <laughs> maybe more in well. fact, it would be helpful if you just tell us how the application is made to prevent to take away travel documents, say, um, if people are trying to leave or they're coming back in to have exclusion, just 
where that would take place and the process and time of it, time scale. Yes, I, I don't have the um, I don't have the relevant papers in front of me um, on the detail of the on the detail of the process. But from what I recall, um, it is a question of um, travel documents being retained um, at the port of exit um, by an official, um, and um, I think it's a senior uh, senior police officer okay. um, who mm -hmm. can authorise that for up to fourteen days. Um, and there is then the possibility of the authorities applying for an extension of the period during which the documents are retained. And it's that um, application um, that there might be proceedings in connection with which would um, attract ABWAR underneath, uh, uh, under this instrument. Um, and that, that would be an, that would be an application in Scotland, that would be an application to the sheriff. To, sheriff. to the okay. sheriff. Okay, right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, because yes, I, I just, apart from that, I was looking at the 10,000 mm. because some of these it could be quite challenging. Uh, and one thinks of the cost of a QC, um, you know, a couple of QCs in there arguing. No, no, these are serious issues. These are serious issues about not letting people back into the country mm. or taking their travel documents from them. It isn't just about Syria. It's about terrorist organisations. And this is not for just tomorrow and this year but for a long time. I'm sorry I've upset somebody from the faculty. Well, I'm not really. But, you know, there, there, there could be serious challenges under human rights here. I, I do it's uh, certainly a, a serious matter. I, mean, I might say that um, the board expect the cost of a hearing itself to be between 750 to £1,000. Um, however, as, as you quite rightly say, can be now, where there's a more complicated case. Yes. Um, each uh, applicant may have a number of hearings and occasion counsel may be required, of course. So assuming that each case might require two hearings, the annual cost to legal aid fund would be between six thousand eight thousand pounds based on the four percent figure that the Ministry uh -huh. of Justice have, have assumed in their costings for us. But obviously we've allowed for in looking at it ourselves that if it was a higher figure that matched our our population share, the UK share of these cases, then it would be uh, maybe up to £16,000. So it's in that sort of ballpark. But we'll obviously keep the matter under review, and if, uh, if it presents any particular difficulties, we can raise that with Parliament. Any other questions on this? Having upset the faculty, I better not need their help at any time. Um, right, that's it. We move on to um, item five. And the formal debate and the motion to approve the instrument. I invite the Minister to move motion S4M 12524. The Justice Committee recommends the advice and assistance assisted by way of representation Scotland Amendment number two regulations be approved. Minister. Formally moved, Convener. I take it no one wishes to speak in relation to the motion having had a debate. The question is that motion S4M 12524 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? That's it. Thank you very much. I thank you, Minister, and your officials. As members are aware, we're required to report to Parliament on all affirmative instruments. Are members content to delegate authority for me to sign off this week's report? Thank you very much. Next meeting is 17th of March. We'll take further evidence on Stage 1, the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill, and consider a draft Stage 1 report on the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill. That's fine. Thank you very much. That evidence next week will be before you leave your seats and pack your school bags. Um, <laughs> TUC, mm -hmm. TUC gangmasters. S2UC Gangmasters Licence Authority. <coughs> They're not coming. And Immigration Enforcement and the UK Human oh, yeah. Trafficking Centre. Thank you very much. Dismissed. End of the meeting.